Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. My name is Jonah, and I founded one of Canada's largest microgreens farms, growing over a quarter million trays of microgreens in my farming career. And I'm on a mission to help growers and farmers grow more food with less resources and make their farms lean profit machines. On today's AMA, we're going to touch on selling living product to chefs, software for microgreens, raising your prices to increase profitability, and so much more. Let's get right into it. The first question is, what is the shelf life on seed and can you buy it in bulk? So this is going to depend on the different varieties of seed that you're using to grow microgreens. So for example, uh, something like sunflower, which is generally one of the seeds that you can store for a long period of time. Um, it only lasts about a year, max two years, uh, things like onions also about a year. And then you have, uh, pea seeds, which I believe are about two to three years. And then you have, for example, brassicas, which are five plus years. I've grown brassica seed, like, uh, Tokyo Bacana mustard or Mizuna that have been, uh, well past five years old. Um, so generally what happens is the germination will go down over time, uh, but different seeds hold their initial germination percentage, um, for a period of time. So sunflower will for the first year should be good. And then after that really starts to decline. Um, whereas brassicas like, you know, broccoli, kale, cabbage, mustards, all that kind of stuff. Um, those seeds will last for five plus years before they start losing their germination. Now you can store them in, um, you can store them in a, in a freezer, but I generally don't recommend that because there's a potential moisture issue. And I did a podcast with uh, high mowing seeds a while back, and that was a, a, a huge, uh, new understanding for me is that like, you know, as you get colder, um, if there's any air in those bags that have from room temperature air, there's going to be a lot of more moisture that the air in the freezer can hold. So, uh, there's potential that you're going to get mold or, or moisture issues on the seed, which can actually deteriorate the shelf life faster than just keeping them at room temperature. And the second question is, can you buy uh, seeds in bulk? And yes, for sure. You can buy seeds in bulk, um, especially the ones that last longer. So if, if there's things like broccoli or kale or mustards that, um, you want to be growing for a long period of time, and maybe you can get a really good price on sometimes seed companies have a sale. Um, those seeds will last for a very long time. Sunflower is one that's a little uh, more difficult to recommend. I generally like to buy a year's worth of sunflower seed once I find a good lot because sunflower is a pain to kind of every every lot of seed is going to be different and grow differently, which is quite unusual in the microgreens world with sunflower. And um, if you buy a large quantity, you avoid that issue. But at the same time, if you buy a large quantity and then orders change or customers don't want sunflower as much anymore, uh, you're stuck with a bunch of seed that will actually go bad and you won't be able to use it. So there is a uh, trade-off there. We've had sunflower seed that lasts well over 18 months, so a year and a half. Um, but I found closer to the two-year mark for me personally, it really starts to like nosedive and uh, you have to use a lot more seed to get the same result. Um, so definitely recommend uh, to buy an amount that is sufficient to last you a longer period of time, but not, not too large that you're going to end up with a bunch of extra seed that you can't use because the germination goes bad. So that'll depend on where you are in your business. So if your business is growing rapidly, then it's easier to buy larger quantities because you're on the upward trajectory of selling more and more product. Um, if you're pretty stable, uh, and you have, you've had, you know, you've had the same customer for years, that also makes it a bit easier. If you're just starting out, and, um, you know, you've been growing for a month or two, I wouldn't recommend buying super large quantities because things change. Um, you know, for example, when I started growing, uh, you know, just food in general, I grew, uh, I wanted to grow a lot of, uh, hydroponic basil. And, um, if I bought like all the supplies, which some of them, to be honest, I did buy more than I needed. I bought these like coconut coir, uh, uh, pots and I had like thousands of them left over because I ended up switching to microgreens because they just made more sense for a business model. Um, so it's, it's at the beginning, it's good not to buy too much because things change and 
um, the way you, you do business will likely change as you learn more and more um, in, in the process. The next question is, do you have any recommendations for small scale germination chambers? So depending on how small you are, um, often I just don't recommend having one um, because it takes up space that can only be used for uh, germinating. And, um, and it's not necessary. Like there's definitely benefits to them, which I believe I touched on uh, the last podcast episode about environmental controls. Um, but, uh, you know, having a small scale germination chamber can be beneficial in that it will increase the speed of germinating the crops. You can get better germination. You uh, may be able to water less often in the germination phase. So uh, it is beneficial. The simplest small scale um, way I would do it is if, is just take a standard rack that you grow microgreens and just kind of, you don't want to completely like enclose it. So you wouldn't want to like put like plastic sheeting all around it because you need some airflow, but you can have something that kind of encloses it in and then you can put um, uh, potentially a small heater or a humidifier if you want in that uh, small area. Um, and then that way you don't have to really build anything because you already have these racks and you can always just, uh, uh, take off those, uh, uh, pieces of plastic or whatever you use to enclose it. You can, uh, take that off and just use it as a growing rack in the future. So it's more versatile that way. Whereas if you build a standalone germination room, um, you know, there's not really much else that space can be used for. So this way, if. Uh, in the future, you need to grow and all of a sudden you're like, okay, germination space is not the priority. I need to grow an extra 20 uh, trays of microgreens. Boom, you can just disassemble it and uh, have a rack ready to go. For most small scale growers, what I generally would recommend is just using something like vermiculite on top of the seed. Um, this will insulate and, and provide like a blanket of, of moisture for the seed. So you will get better germination than if you just had the seeds on top of the soil with nothing on top, except for the, you know, the tray above it. Um, and then you could just put them on the top level of your growing racks, which should have a little bit of heat from the lights. Um, and that's an easy way just to start where there's really no cost. Um, and you're just utilizing space that's not best utilized, which is the top of your growing racks because there's nothing growing there because there's no lights there. So it's an ideal space. You get a little bit of extra heat from the lights underneath and it's a good uh, short-term solution for those that want to increase uh, and improve the germination without building a germination room or chamber. Introducing the Little Green Seeding Machine. This tool can help you seed your microgreens up to 300 trays per hour. With all this extra free time you'll have, you can spend it growing the business with sales and production, or you can spend more time with family and friends and less time on the farm. The Little Green Seed Machine works with all of the most common microgreens varieties, including pea, sunflower, radish, brassicas, mustards, amaranth, basil, and so many more. This tool seeds much more evenly than hand seeding, reducing disease risk while also increasing the uniformity of your crops, and do it twice as fast. Pre-order your Little Green Seed Machine today and join the microgreens revolution. The next question is, I'm considering switching my farm to just living trays for chefs. Are there any disadvantages to selling microgreens this way? So this, this is a question that really hits uh, home for me. I started my farm selling just living trays um, because it was just easier, to be honest. It's, it's way less labor. Um, there's no harvest. There's no packaging. You just pick up the tray, put it in a box or in a container and then send it off to the customer. So it was a much more efficient way to, uh, you know, get rid of the whole harvest and packaging process, which is the biggest bottleneck for microgreens farms. So that's a big advantage of it. Now, the big disadvantage is there's just not as much demand for living microgreens. Uh, you can definitely make a business out of it. It's just a lot harder to make it large. And then there's a whole bunch of other quality shelf life, uh, customer relations issues that you run into. Um, and then also food safety risks that you're putting on yourself. So if like, you know, uh, you know, a chef with all sorts of other foods, uh, has a living tray there and someone, you know, touches some raw meat, uh, and then cuts the microgreens and put them on a dish because they're new and don't understand the basics of, you know, food safety, 
uh, the liability is probably going to fall on you uh, because if they can trace back that there was uh, contamination on the actual trays, uh, then you're liable for that. So uh, the odds of them finding that are pretty slim, to be honest, but like it's still a liability that you are putting on yourself by selling living product. Um, you're also uh, subjecting yourself to quality issues because if it's a living tray and um, the chef has it out and it's really humid in the kitchen, it's it's possible it can grow more mold. Or if there's already mold spores there because they're really dense, uh, it can really start forming more and more in that environment uh, where it's just out in room temperature without lights. Uh, it also, like, the crops will stretch. So something like pea shoots just won't look the same after a few days. Um, and a lot of the smaller leaf microgreens will get uh, longer longer stems and the leaves will start to look different. They won't, they'll look like they're not under light, like they're stretching for light. Um, so there's a lot of quality issues there. It's also a bit harder to, to deliver them. Uh, if you grow microgreens that the stems are really long in transport, um, you know, as the, you know, it's on a truck or, or your car or whatever, it's going to be bouncing up and down. It's much more likely to fall over and, uh, and just look like a subpar quality microgreen. So there's a few issues there. Um, some of them could be, you know, fixed and worked through, but the, the demand pr part of it is really where there's the biggest issue. There's just not enough demand for living microgreens unless, you know, maybe if you're just selling to chefs and you live in a, a large U.S. or Canadian city, you can make it work. But it's just you're going to hit a bottleneck at some point with sales where it just gets harder and harder to get sales because in my experience, uh, most people want cut product. If you just think about it logically, if you're a chef, you're busy, uh, you got a, a ton going on every day. Um, do you really want to have to spend your time or your staff's time to cut the microgreens product? Um, take care of it. So you have like, make sure it's well uh, watered and it's not going to dry out. And then also dispose of the pot tray and or soil after uh, it's harvested. Most chefs are going to just rather just buy a, a cut product in a clamshell that can be stored in a fridge that uh, so they can just take out of the fridge, put it on a dish. It just logically makes sense. And I've noticed a, like one of the biggest good decisions I made for the business um, was to switch from living product to cut product. And the, that's when the business started to boom. So, um, you know, it doesn't mean just because you have cut product, your business is going to boom, but uh, it, it's, again, it's all these decisions that you make that move you in the right direction to having a viable long-term business like automation, um, you know, having good sales tactics, having a really good product is probably the number one thing. Um, and these things will make your life a lot easier in selling your product and uh, running your business and making it profitable. Next, I want to set up an automatic watering system for my farm as I would like to be able to take weekends off here and there. I would like to create a simple recirculating system with water going from a large tank to the levels on a timer. How do you recommend setting this up? So it's pretty easy to set up what you're talking about. Um, you just have like a holding tank, uh, which you need to size based on how many trays you want to grow, how many levels you have. You obviously need flood tables for this to work. So you can't just do it in regular uh, 10 by 20 trays. You need flood tables for that. Uh, and then you have a line going from the tank from a pump in the tank to uh, the levels and then just a, a watering timer. Um, so it'd be pretty simple. Now, uh, as simple as that is, there's a lot of potential issues with these type of systems. Um, one, anything that's recirculating is a huge risk for spreading disease. So pythium or dampening off spreads in water. So if you have one tray in your system uh, that has dampening off, you're recirculating that disease throughout your whole system. So this is where having a professionally designed or made watering system can make a big difference. Um, you can also do it yourself like I did it myself. Um, uh, it's just like if you don't have the knowledge, it can be very time consuming to figure out. So it's like, what's your time worth versus, uh, you know, uh, you know, how, how much money do you want to spend on, on, on a system like this? Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, second, ideally, you want to have uh, first not recirculating Two. You want to have each level be watered independently. So having uh, a lot of farms do where it'll it'll water at the top and then go once it fills up the top, it'll go to the next level. Uh, it'll fill up that one, go to the next level below, and the water's recirculating uh, throughout different trays. So you have the same disease risk issue uh, with that. 
And then also every crop is different. So you don't necessarily want every crop to be watered every time you need to water. So if you only press one, one timer on and then it waters everything, there's crops that will uh, not benefit, will actually have a disadvantage because they're going to be getting too much water uh, or vice versa. Some crops are going to not get enough water. So having each level water independently is the best way to do it. And um, just having valves on each level is the simplest way to do that and an inlet and an outlet for each level that independent of each other level. Um, so this is where obviously it takes much more hardware. So having four by eight flood tables make more sense than using the standard uh, growing racks that people use. So it is a, a bigger change and a bigger investment, um, but it saves you a ton of time in the long run. Watering by hand is um, something at scale doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, in my opinion. Of course, there's lots of farms that water by hand and are doing fine, uh, but it just makes it a lot harder to take vacation. It, take, it takes a lot of labor. It, it, it's definitely more accurate to water by hand because you can choose how much water uh, goes in each and every single tray. Uh, but it makes it also harder to train employees when you're doing it that way. It's much easier to just like tell them, hey, push this button or start this crop recipe and then nothing else has to be done by the staff. Like that's a much better long-term solution uh, that makes it easier and less chance of problems uh, arising with staff not being trained properly or watering too much. Um, having automation uh, and equipment do that for you will prevent that. And the last question here is, I've been selling my microgreens for the same price for the last two years since I started my business. I want to raise my prices to account for the higher cost I now have, but I'm scared that customers will stop buying my product. Any suggestions you have? Um, so this one also is totally relatable. I think a lot of farms uh, and people can relate that like raising prices is not something that's uh, easy or comfortable to do because you want your customers to uh, still buy your product and it is true that raising your price may discourage some people from continuing to buy it. Uh, but my experience firsthand uh, in raising prices pretty much almost every year for, you know, probably six or seven years uh, in, in the business, uh, it wasn't as big of a deal as I thought to the point where during COVID um, I thought uh, there was one year where like costs went up like 20%. It, it was crazy. Like it, it must have been 2022 uh, when inflation was just out of hand. Um, and I wasn't going to raise my prices 20% because that was a bit too much. So I found a balancing point at 12.5% and, um, and just took a little bit of a, a lower margin um, because not a lot of people in, in the market were actually raising prices, which was surprising. But we decided to still raise prices. So we raised them 12.5%. And that's a big increase uh, overnight for people to uh, swallow, right? So um, I was expecting this like big pushback and I was worried that people were going to uh, not buy our product or like sales were going to plummet because of this price range. And honestly, it barely had an impact. Like, I think we had maybe two customers be like, oh, like this is a big increase. Like this might affect sales or whatever. And then everyone else was like, yeah, that's fine. And has didn't have a, like any negative impact. So all of a sudden overnight, you have roughly a 12 and a half percent increase in uh, revenue because um, you raised your prices um, without any real consequence. So if you have a good quality product and you're being reasonable, like you're not trying to like price gouge your customers, um, they will understand like the market as a whole, uh, you know, if, if costs are going up, your costs are going to go up as well. There's no way around that. And I think it's important for microgreens farms to account accurately for the changes in their costs. Um, and we have the microgreens cost calculator that you can download from uh, microgreenscalling.com that uh, you can pretty much find out what your costs are for each product and then save multiple copies of that document and then and then adjust your input costs based on what it actually costs you in different periods of time and you can compare okay from last year to this year my costs went up five percent then you know okay i can raise my prices five percent that's pretty fair and reasonable so um that that's something i definitely recommend if you don't already do that Keep an eye on what your costs are. It's very easy to get lost in uh, what your what the changes are over time if you don't have them marked down in an organized way. So the microgreens cost calculator allows you to do that super easily. You just put in the different costs of your inputs, and then you get the output of uh, you know what your margins are, what your net profit is per tray per uh, clamshell, and then it makes it a lot easier to make those decisions on raising prices going forward. But the simple 
answer is don't worry about um, raising uh, your prices as assuming that they are fair and reasonable and they are in, in line with what's happening in the market as a whole. Um, I, I, then don't worry. I wouldn't worry about about it as much as you probably would intuitively think. Uh, that's just my experience from doing it for many years. And uh, and each year you do it, it gets easier, just like sales. Um, you know, it's uncomfortable raising prices, it's often uncomfortable going out and doing sales calls for the first time. So the more you do it and the more you get comfortable with it, um, the easier it gets. Another quick tip is just having an, an like in your email that you like, I wouldn't just send an email be like, hey, our prices are going up 5%, boom, send. It would be like, hey, um, you know, we've experienced some significant cost increases this last year. Uh, we're doing our best to uh, implement, you know, uh, cost effective savings for to pass on to our customers. Um, but our costs have still increased by 5%, even with everything we've been working on to make it more efficient or, you know, whatever, some sort of uh, positive pitch of uh, raising prices, but working hard for your customers to keep prices low. Like something like that can go a long way um, in just keeping the relationship strong and, and having your customers understand uh, that you're raising prices rather than just being like, we're raising our prices and that's it. No explanation, no uh, no story behind it. So um, yeah, that's that could be super, super uh, helpful in um, making that process of raising prices go smoothly. So hope this helps you guys on your microgreens journey. And thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the microgreens mastery podcast to access a wealth of insights. Just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of microgreens businesses and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at microgreens consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.